and clomiphene, the pill that's able to increase our body's own production of testosterone. Today, we're gonna to look at whether or not this oral medication can replace testosterone injections and who it may be beneficial for, who it may not be. We're gonna look at its mechanism of action and any potential side effects to look out for. So what is enclomiphene? Enclomiphene is considered to be a selective estrogen receptor modulator or a CERM, meaning that it binds to specific estrogen receptors and acts in a certain way and not others. And ultimately what this does to the body is that it tricks the body into thinking that it's in a low estrogen state. And when estrogen can only be in the male body converted from primarily testosterone, it ultimately makes the body think that it's in a low testosterone state. And in return to this feedback loop, it causes the body to increase its own testosterone production. And in certain scenarios, we can utilize this medication to increase patients' testosterone levels. So now let's dive into a little bit deeper exactly how this medication works, how testosterone is produced in the body to get a really deep understanding of the pharmacology, pharmacodynamics, and pharmacokinetics of enclomiphene. So enclomiphene was originally a part of a mixture of a parent medications called clomiphene citrate. Clomiphene citrate was made up of two components, essentially, one being zooclomiphene and one being enclomiphene. These are stereoisomers of one another, but they have distinct actions within the body. And clomiphene was primarily used in female fertility, but it was also found that when taken in males, it was able to increase the Test, own body's testosterone production. And later on, when enclomiphene was isolated, the side effect profile of the parent medication seemed to be significantly less. So when they took out zooclomiphene, which was made up of about 68% of that original racemic mixture, and 32% of it was enclomiphene. So we were just taking that enclomiphene portion. The difference between the two is that enclomiphene has a half-life of roughly 10 to 20 hours and zooclomiphene can have a half significantly longer half-life of 13 to 30 days and whereas zooclomiphene had some estrogen agonism versus antagonism meaning it stimulated the estrogen receptor instead of ultimately just blocking it there was seemed to be significant side effects such as increased clotting factors some ocular or eye issues and some mood issues as well and we haven't seen that same side effect profile when using enclomiphene alone. So how exactly does enclomiphene work? So testosterone is produced on a cascade system and a negative feedback loop is how it's regulated. And testosterone production begins in the hypothalamus, which is a central portion of the brain, where the hypothalamus releases what's called gonadotropin releasing hormone. And that travels to another part of the brain called the pituitary gland. In response to the GnRH or the gonadotropin releasing hormone, the pituitary gland then produces what's called luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone or LH and FSH. This then enters circulation and travels to the testicles. And in response to the luteinizing hormone, the testicles increase testosterone production. And in response to the follicle stimulating hormone, the testicles increase spermatogenesis or sperm production. Partly within the testicles and partly within peripheral tissues, meaning tissues outside of the testicles, that testosterone travels around the body and exerts its effects, but it's also then converted to estrogen via an enzyme called aromatase or a process called aromatization. So then that's where in the male body we get the balance of testosterone and estrogen. When estrogen is then traveling back around the body through, the, through multiple tissues in the vasculature and entering and exerting its beneficial effects, similar to women, how women need estrogen, men do as well. When it gets back up to the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland, the regulators there that determine the level or amount of binding of estrogen can say whether they need to increase their production of ultimately testosterone or decrease it. And so, when we take enclomiphene, the selective estrogen receptor modulator, we're aiming to, through a competitive antagonism, block the actual estrogen receptors, primarily estrogen receptor alpha, within the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. So what does this cause? If we're blocking those receptors, the body or the brain then thinks that we have a low state of estrogen, which means we have a low state of testosterone, and it'll, it'll increase the production of gonadotropin-releasing hormone and ultimately luteinizing hormone and follicle-stimulating hormone, which then if the testicles are working in response to those signals will increase testosterone production. So enclomiphene works as a competitive antagonist. What does that mean? It means that it doesn't 
completely and irreversibly bind the estrogen receptor, which in this situation is a good thing because that means that we're not completely blocking the effects of estrogen. And if estrogen levels are high enough, they can outcompete or surmount the actual drug itself, which is good because it essentially allows the body to have still a regulator, a homeostatic mechanism to allow for estrogen to exert its effects in the hypothalamus and the pituitary and some other peripheral tissues. And so ultimately what enclomiphene allows us to do is to trick the body into producing more testosterone than it would regularly by thinking it's in a low estrogen state, which ultimately means upstream that it's in a low testosterone state. So who could benefit from taking enclomiphene and why would somebody want to use it? A person that could benefit from taking enclomiphene is someone who has a low production of luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone, but still has completely healthy functioning testicles. And in that situation, we call that secondary hypogonadism. Primary hypogonadism is where the testicles actually can't produce testosterone. Secondary hypogonadism means that the pituitary gland, the one step up, is not producing enough or is incapable of producing luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. And then tertiary hypogonadism would be the hypothalamus not producing gonadotropin releasing hormone. So in a sit situation in which that we see lower testosterone levels, that's exerting some hypogonadal effects, fatigue, weight gain, uh, mood disturbances, decreased sleep, decreased recovery, lower libido, whatever it may be. And we look at the lab work and we see low testosterone levels, but we also see a very low luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. We can then assume that by increasing the luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone, assuming that it's responsive to the GnRH and the enclomiphene medication, that when we increase the LH and FSH through enclomiphene, that we're gonna see an increase in testosterone production and possibly a alleviation of symptoms in that situation. And so another reason why we would want to, in this situation, use enclomiphene or in certain patients use enclomiphene is because we're able to maintain fertility. So to maintain endogenous or meaning our own production of testosterone from the testicles, the testicles need the luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone signal to continue their production and use. And when we use exogenous testosterone or testosterone replacement therapy from outside of the body, the testicles no longer need to produce their own testosterone, which in a lot of patients is fine as long as they uh, don't want to or don't need to maintain their fertility. And then we can manage the testosterone with a uh, bioidentical or synthetic form of testosterone. But if we wanna make sure that we maintain fertility parameters within patients while trying to increase the testosterone production, the first line in that situation would either be HCG or enclomiphene because that is going to cause the body to increase its own production of all the hormones and hormonal cascade required for testosterone production and ultimately fertility preservation. So the question that I often get a lot is, can enclomiphene replace testosterone replacement therapy? And the answer is in some patients, it's, it may work as an alternative, but ultimately no, it cannot. Reason being is as patients age, their brain and testicles tend to be less responsive to signals and less capable of producing their hormones at the, at the cell tissue. Meaning in the testicles, they become less capable of increasing testosterone levels or in the brain, it they become less capable of producing luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. So if a patient had primary hypogonadism, meaning that the testicles were incapable of producing either any or enough testosterone, then no matter the amount of luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone that we were able to increase the output to by, in, by utilizing enclomiphene, the testicles still wouldn't respond to it or maybe not be responsive enough to take testosterone levels high enough to alleviate symptoms. And in that situation, we would need to use testosterone replacement therapy. Also in some patients, we don't see the same beneficial effects psychologically that we do uh, from testosterone that we see with the use of enclomiphene. Some patients react extremely well to enclomiphene and they're able to take their testosterone from say an arbitrary number of 400 nanograms per deciliter to seven or 800 nanograms per deciliter, which is often a jump like that enough to alleviate symptoms. But in some patients psychologically, they don't notice that drive um, and that increased motivation that testosterone can often give. And in that situation, 
we can often switch patients to testosterone replacement therapy and they're able to achieve that psychological and physiologic um, symptom relief that we're looking for. And this is likely because of partial antagonism of those estrogen receptors in the brain and whether patients are predisposed to feel worse when those are blocked or not, or because we can maintain significantly more stable levels of testosterone by using an actual testosterone injection versus the pill that we're reliant upon the body's own production of luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. And in some patients, patients just don't react well to the enclomiphene to where, um, like I said, no matter how high we take luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone, the testicles still are not responsive in improving or increasing their um, testosterone production. And so to kind of review what I just talked about there, can it replace testosterone injections? No, it can't necessarily. But in some patients that have functioning testicles and just a lower luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone output, and clomiphene may be a great, great medication in that situation to maintain fertility and optimize testosterone levels or bring testosterone levels up to the higher end of the reference range. The nice thing also about n is that we're limited by the natural production, and so we have to worry significantly less about reaching supraphysiologic testosterone levels that can sometimes occur with misdosed or too high of dosed testosterone injections. So what are the potential side effects or are there any side effects with N-clomiphene use? A lot of the side effects seen with N-clomiphene or thought of with N-clomiphene come from the actual parent compound, again, or parent medication called clomiphene citrate or clomid. And reason being is because that other portion of the mixture, the racemic mixture of Clomid was Zooclomiphene. And again, Zooclomiphene had a, a 13 to 30 day half-life and it had partial agonism, meaning activation of the estrogen receptors versus the 28% mixture um, that was N-Clomiphene that only has a 10 to 20 hour half-life and has virtually from the literature I've read on the pharmacodynamics and kinetics of it that it seems to have a pretty accurate just antagonism of the estrogen receptor, meaning that it binds again to the estrogen receptor, but doesn't allow for conformational and transcriptional estrogen genetic changes to allow for either direct activation of what estrogen would allow for and or it doesn't seem to have any other co-activators that seem to be stimulated by the enclomiphene. And so potential side effects of increased estrogen receptor activation is with, say, let's just talk about Clomid, is having some ocular side effects of having retinopathy or floaters or decreased peripheral vision. And sometimes with the Clomid itself, which again is the zooclomiphene and enclomiphene mixture, not the enclomiphene isolated alone, is having increased clotting factors from the liver and which can ultimately lead to thromboembolic events or clots, which can have pulmonary embolism, heart attacks, strokes, whatever it may be. But we don't seem to, to notice that with enclomiphene because it's not acting as an agonist like the zooclomiphene does, but it seems to only act as an antagonist and specifically within the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. Now, with that being said, I do believe that there is likely some peripheral tissue effects that can occur from enclomiphene. And so in a patient that had a significantly high risk of clotting, say a factor V light deficiency, this may not be a medication worth using. And if used, should be monitored very, very, very closely to make sure that even though the literature doesn't seem to indicate it, that there wouldn't be any thromboembolic or um, clotting events that may occur. But overall from from what I've, what I've seen and, and read and used in patients, there doesn't seem to be many significant side effects from enclomiphene that used to happen with the parent compound, clomid or clomiphene citrate, like the mood changes, again, the ocular changes, the increased um, clotting risks. And that's likely, again, due to its more accurate antagonism versus agonism, and it's, it's very short half-life compared to the zooclomiphene or the clomid that had a 13 to 30 day half-life. So overall, to conclude here, and clomiphene is a very unique medication in that it can be taken orally, it can maintain fertility, it can increase our body's own production of testosterone, and that it has a relatively short half-life so we can test different doses, dosages within patients and see how patients respond. It may be a great start, 
before implementing complete testosterone replacement therapy to see if patients react well to it. And in some patients, they feel phenomenal on it and were able to take testosterone to the upper end of the reference range and alleviate any of the potential symptoms that can occur with decreased testosterone levels. If you have any questions about enclomiphene that I didn't answer in this video, please leave them in the comments below. Hit like, subscribe. Uh, we're trying to grow the channel and thanks for watching.